What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. to tell podcast episode 179 dexter Henry, brian fonseca Choo. doing the thing we are here and it's nba playoff season i've been talking a lot of nba for people who caught me on the nba exchange been talking a lot of nba lately but we haven't had a chance to really really talk it here although last episode we went into awards but we're here in the postseason brian we finally have playoff basketball we don't have to talk about bullshit overrated regular season stats. I'm tired of talking about this shit. Bullshit regular season stats that people want to hype up and say matters more than it does. That's another discussion for another day. But how are you doing, man? It ain't just the stats of some of these advanced analytics, too. They be having you think dudes are better than they are. You know what I mean? And we yeah. got people We got people out here voting Rudy Gobert second for MVP. Like, you know, shit like that that has to stop. Like, that's, that's just, like Murph said in the group chat when I brought that up, that's just somebody overthinking the award. Work. But other than that, like, yo, smooth and solid, ready to talk some playoffs uh, and some other stuff that we got uh, later on in the episode. Yeah, no, we do. All right, so the playoffs, you know, started uh, this past weekend for you guys hearing us. This episode's out a little day later than we normally do because I was unable to go because allergies were kicking my ass the other day. But I'm, I'm good and I'm fine. Could, there's worse things you can be sick with right now than allergies. That's for sure. Uh, but started this weekend. We had eight games. There's been some surprising developments. We're staying away from some games that may have occurred on Tuesday night for folks when they're listening to this. But there's been some surprising developments that we've seen through some of the game ones, some of the game twos. Uh, I guess, Brian, I'll ask you this thus far. What has been the most surprising thing you've, you've seen so far in the playoffs? What, what has developed thus far that's been surprising? Something tells me it might have to do with that Milwaukee Bucks Miami Heat series. Something tells me that might be your answer. Is that the case? In terms of surprising, well, here's the thing. Like sometimes teams get hot. I remember the Cleveland Cavaliers had a game a couple years ago where they made like a record number of three-pointers. Like sometimes that happens. I didn't quite expect it from Milwaukee, but you know, maybe that's the most surprising development to me, but interestingly enough from the day we're recording this is 2 years to the day where the Toronto Raptors clinched their first ever Eastern Conference Championship. They did so after trailing the Milwaukee Bucks two games to none, and they did so after that second game was a blowout loss, similar to what we just saw with the Miami Heat. I'm not saying the Heat are going to come back, uh, and we'll you get can into say it. You no, can say it. no, because we'll get into why they probably shouldn't even. But at the same time, like I would call that a, a shot. Like that was shocking. Bryn Forbes, Dante Divincenzo, Pat Connaughton. Um, even Giannis, I think, made a couple of threes or something along those lines. Like, But also just Phoenix beating the Lakers in game one, I wouldn't say shocking in terms of them actually coming away with the win because I do think they could win that series, and we're not going to get too deeply into it because game two will already have happened by the time we put this out. But the way in which they did it was very impressive, despite a Chris Paul injury. So I feel like all of these series, or not all, but about five, six of these eight series have a chance to be close. Yeah. And I think that, you know, what we've seen from the very early portion of the playoffs sort of highlights that. Yeah, I'll stay away from another series too, although I think there was some, sh- I don't want, it wasn't surprising to me. I wasn't surprised, and I'll go out and say this, I was not surprised in Mavericks won game one against the Clippers. Because if you watch any of our other programming, including NBA picks and props with myself and Brian, you know what my motto is. Clips are going to clip. And yep. this is what they did. I don't trust the Clippers necessarily. Brian and I, uh, my people might say we had a lot of balls on this. We picked the Mavs. Did we do six or seven, Brian? I can't remember. Did we pick six or seven? It doesn't really matter. We picked I don't the remember. Mavs, I, I think I think I I might have done six. We might have done six. Did seven. We might have done six because – I. 
Well, if I'm picking the upset, I yeah, with the road, like to go with the road six. teams, yeah. you like the road I usually team like to go six. Yeah, I remember. You know, I remember that being your point, and I think I went and did it. And I think I like the odds in it, but that's a whole other story. So I'm not surprised. Luca did Luca things there. I, I will go with Brian on. I don't, again, I picked the Lakers over the Suns, but what I was most surprised about in that Suns game one victory was how well DeAndre Ayton played. That's what surprised me. He was fantastic. I think anybody watching the series would have said, hey, he's got to bring it for the Suns to really have a chance. And, I mean, he more than brought it, 21-16. and 16. Uh, Obviously, we'll see what happens in, in Game 2, so we won't talk too much about that. But then if you want to flip the other side of it, all right, DeAndre Ayton looked great, but where the hell was Anthony Davis in that game? I mean, you couldn't find him. And I think it's time we start talking about Anthony Davis. We saw him play very well uh, into in last year in the bubble. He was fantastic throughout the bubble. Looked like the best player in the bubble throughout the playoffs. But now as we are in the twilight of LeBron's career, the whole reason Anthony Davis was brought on and, and he won in here was he's supposed to be that bridge for LeBron to step up and get it done. And it's like, yo, LeBron with the injury he had to end the season, the injury uh, before that that kept him out for some time, this is where they need AD. I don't know if AD is not healthy or not, but something just doesn't look right. Brian and I have talked about this for quite some time. We don't think it, he looks right. But look, it's playoffs, man. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. It's go time. And we'll see what happens going forward. But Anthony Davis is going to have to step up in a big way for the Lakers because they need their two best players going. It's sad that – I don't want to say it's sad, but it's – I'm more comfortable. Even though LeBron hasn't looked great, he's looked better than Anthony Davis. And I feel like I at least will know kind of what I can get out of him. Anthony Davis cannot be losing his matchup to DeAndre Ayton. And that's no shade to DeAndre Ayton. DeAndre Ayton was putting in that work. But Anthony Davis is paid like a superstar, so you got to be a superstar. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And DeAndre Ayton, although he was the first overall pick uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago, Anthony Davis... Anthony, da- well, that's another story for another day, but Anthony Davis is somebody who, coming into the year, he was like a trendy MVP, defensive player of the year, uh, selection, prediction, whatever. The odds on him were very, very good, mm-hmm. and he was one of the guys that was up there across those categories. And on top of that, we all you know, sort of exited the bubble and was like, yo, this dude, like, if he stays healthy, which is always a big if with, with him, as we've seen, if he stays healthy, he could really be that dude. But as we're seeing now, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm sure that he isn't 100% because I just assume that he's not. And LeBron James said that he's never going to be 100% again or whatever. You know, a little dramatic. Propaganda season. Word to Gerard. Propaganda I, season. I do think there's something to, like, the high ankle sprain probably hampering him from being, you know, fully 100% because that's typically how high ankle sprains function. Um, and he has a lot of miles on him, whatever, whatever. But, you know, we'll see what happens going forward. Uh, as it relates to, you know, the Lakers and the Suns, which is a series that I'm going to be glued to. Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Moving on to uh, another series that you know I'm glued to. You know our producer Greg is glued to. You know that's for sure. The Hawks versus the Knicks. uh, Game one. uh, By the time people hear this, we'll be going into game two. Trey Young, Ice Trey, Trey DeBarge, whatever you want to call him. He uh, sunk the Knicks with a runner with .9 seconds left. So they won 109-107 in in, – Wait, that's, that game did not go to overtime. Sorry, I was confused. That game did not go to overtime at the end of regulation. 109-107. Uh, look, a couple things. Let me say this as a Knicks fan. I love seeing playoff basketball back at Madison Square Garden. I love seeing the people back in the building, most of the people in vaccinated sections, thankfully. Uh, love the energy you heard 
It felt like a playoff game. It was the most energy I felt like we heard of all the playoff games on the weekend. Nick fans are pumped up. They're giving it to Trey Young, F Trey Young, all the expletives. I love it. Love people coming to the garden, somebody being a villain. This is what the playoffs is about. If you don't like this, you know, get out of here. Don't, don't be watching basketball with this, right? You come into a hostile territory, you should want to win. I know as a Knicks fan back in the day how good it felt to go into Indiana and get a win, Miami and get a win. You know, it felt good to do that. But I, I thought about this and I said, wow, you know, the fans were giving it to Trey Young. Trey Young had the last laugh, shut up the Knicks. But we haven't seen a, a sort of villainous dude in the NBA, right? Like in a minute where like this one team hated this person. You know, maybe you could think about how the Kings fans hated Kobe and Shaq coming in there, right? They didn't like that. The Knicks back in the day hated Reggie Miller and obviously hated MJ coming in. Uh, you know, our producer Greg brings up a great point. Maybe you're talking about the Miami Heat, but that was kind of a whole league hating them, right? Like it's these very specific individual market matchups. And I like that. We, we haven't had this in a while, right? And you might not like Trey Young for a lot of other things, right? Like maybe you think it's stupid that the Mavericks took him over Doncic. I think that's stupid. Um, and that's no shade to Trey Young. Maybe you don't like Trey Young's game, which I don't think Brian does because he hunts fouls. And you might think that's corny. But you have to at least respect, in my opinion, that it's good for the game. Him being a villain is good for the sport. Even if you didn't tune into game one, you might now have seen everything that went up and he shut up the crowd. And now you might say, hey, I want to check and see what he's going to do in game two. Can the Knicks stop him? Will, will, you know, will, will they get him rattled? I want to see this. I think this is good. We haven't seen this in a long time in the NBA. Brian, do you think that this is good as well, too? Because I think it's great for the league, and we need more villains. You should appreciate this as a wrestling guy, right? You can't just have a whole bunch of faces. you got to have heels as well, too. That's what makes the yep. sport good, at least from what I take from watching wrestling. I'm not the biggest wrestling fan, but I understand that people get amped up when there's these dudes or women that they don't like in the sport, and they want to see them lose so badly, right? It's a formula that traditionally works. You want the good guy to face the bad guy, or the good woman to face the bad woman. That's just how you normally goes. Now, the fans can determine who is good and who's bad in the equation. Like the NWO was really the first thing to kind of swing this. And I'm going to bring this back to Trey Young in this way. The NWO were the bad guys, but they became cool. So they were the good guys. And in ECW, this was a normal occurrence. And then you started seeing it in WWE in later years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Especially when people were fighting John Cena when he was, you know, at his peak. With Trey Young, he, to New York, is the villain. But to other people who probably hate New York, he might be somewhat of a hero. And that makes this very interesting because now it's just, you know, how do you see this thing, right? Like, who are you sort of pulling for here? For me personally, I was never the biggest Trey Young fan. I think he's super talented and has a potential to be, you know, like a big star in the league. I just hate, you know, the foul hunting. And I don't care for how much guards are like shooting from 30 feet out you know, all the time, this, this, and that. Like, Damian Lillard makes a shot from the logo yesterday, but Damian Lillard makes those shots, like, fairly regularly, probably more efficiently than anybody in the NBA at those insane three-pointers or whatever. I like, and I also just generally like point guards who are, you know, more inclined to pass. So I did like the way Trey Young was playing post-Nate McMillan joining because I felt like he was playing a little bit more of a point guard and they had the ball when he was out in bog and Bogdan Bogdanovich's hands more. And, you know, that actually helped them in a way. But I think him being a villain is is not just great for the NBA, but it's great for him because regardless of how his career goes from here on out, like this is the thing with the Knicks. Like people can say all they want about like, you know, the Knicks being great is not necessarily mean that it's great for the NBA. And really, when you're talking about like there's there's like three markets you really care about, New York, Boston and L.A. in that way. Right. If those teams are good, then, yes, that is a win for the NBA. If those teams aren't good, then, yeah, it, it's kind of like it's kind of sucks because New York, you want them to be interesting. You want them to be in the news. You want them to be good so that people care about them. And this is why. Because if Trey Young is doing this to the Nets, nobody gives a shit. If Trey Young oh, is doing man. this. man. You're going to piss off some Nets It's fans. true, though. This if will go Trae, into our next conversation. If Trey Young is doing this to the Wizards, nobody gives a shit. If Trey Young is doing this to X, Y, and Z. Like, there are few teams where you'll get that. Even in Miami, you'll get, like, a certain amount of 
you know, hatred from that fan base. And, you know, they're very loud and cocky in a lot of ways as well. Like Boston, I mean, if this happened in Boston, nothing needs to be said there. But with the Knicks in particular, like this is great for his career because no matter what happens from here on out, he's going to be a villain every time he comes to New York City, you know, unless he inevitably, I mean, not inevitably, unless he ends up joining them one day, which, you know, I mean, let's not even try to project that down the future. But this is a great move for him to sort of lean into it and we'll see what actually happens in the series. But either way, he's going to be booed. Yeah, yeah, I, I like, and he should. Be, I think he handled it well, and you know, wanting to shove the crowd. And I like, I like, I like having the villains, and I like seeing the villains embrace that too. I think that the greatness of Reggie Miller was that he embraced it. He never ran from it. He was like, "Nope, this is who I am. I want to kill the Knicks." You know, he had the whole choking thing. Of course, growing up watching the Knicks, being a Knicks fan, I was like, "Ugh, couldn't stand Reggie Miller." But you know, when you looked at how he embraced it and what it did for his career, and it, wanting the moments and wanting to hit the big shots. And playing well at MSG, that's good. You need dudes who like playing well at MSG. Even as much as as a Nick fan, you want to see people have poor performances at MSG. It also just as a fan, it makes it interesting, makes it better, makes the series more tantalizing. I do think Brian, you bring up a great point. It does matter who these villains are going up against and where they're going up against. If it's if against Orlando, this isn't a national thing. Right. If it's against Brooklyn, the Nets fans will hate him because they'll give it to him or whatever. Yeah, but outside, yeah, yeah. But outside of that. Like, what, what is it going to be? Like, those, that's the thing. When you become a villain against certain teams, like, those fan bases will remember. But when you do it against the Knicks, you might have a documentary about you one day. Ask yeah, Reggie Miller. That's, there, there you go. That's a good, that's a really good point. And, you know, because those fans, those fan bases are a little bit bigger and spread throughout the country, these other teams, other markets really hate those fan bases. And so that only adds more fuel to it. It's not just about those fan bases. You said the Lakers and Knicks. The Celtics is really about how the other teams feel about them, and that's what matters too. So as much as Nick fans are going to be giving it to Trey Young throughout the series, there's a lot of people rooting for Trey Young to give it to the Knicks as well, and I think that's really good for basketball and absolutely should not be discounted. Now, you talked about the Knicks, and you talked about the Nets, and you're laughing. I'm, I'm a little surprised we're doing this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, we're doing well because you called me the other day with an interesting theory, and I was like, all right, we gotta, we have to talk about it. And here in New York, and I have been somebody who I'll just be clear, grew up a Nick fan, but I've been sort of staying away uh, from this conversation because I think the conversation can get to be a little bit ridiculous, to be honest. But there's been a whole back and forth between Knicks and Nets fans. We know the Nets have championship aspirations with the big three. Knicks fans with, I still think the big 15 name is corny. I don't like that. I think it's whack. No, don't call yourself the big 15. We don't need to do that. Um, Who's called yourself the big 15? The Knicks did. Like, so this was a, you know, you know, you don't, you don't remember this, Brian? They had a, uh, this was a before a game against the Nets, I believe. And they said, oh, how do you think you guys are going to match with the yeah, Big did, Three? Did, was it Julius like Randle Bullock? And, and Reggie Bullock. I think it was yeah. Reggie Bullock who had it. And he was like, oh, we're not the Big Three. We got the Big 15. And I was like, okay. Yeah. That, no, I, I, yeah I'm not really no. fond of that name. But there's been this back and forth between the fan bases. Who runs New York? Who's more important to New York? Who's bigger in New York? What? Who's more relevant? All this stuff that doesn't matter. Um and I was talking with a Nets fan the other day, actually right before game one, the Nets played the Celtics. Uh, and I ended up talking to some other Nets fans outside Barclays Center about this. And, you know, you know, they were kind of saying, like, agree with it. Like, it doesn't really matter. And, you know, we should be one New York. I'm a Knicks fan who doesn't want to see, you know, I'm not rooting for the Nets. I don't really pay too much attention or care that way. But I don't root for them to be do badly or not needling their fans. Um, do you, do you think that this back and forth between the fan bases, do you think it, you think it matters? Should people care? Does it mean something in the grand scheme of things? Is one team more relevant than the other? Uh, you know, what, what, what do you think? Cause Brian sent me a, told me a theory that I think has some social and cultural relevance to it. <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting and I will support the, the parts of it that I think make a lot of sense when you think about it in terms of New York history. But Brian, share with the people what you think matters about this. I think a lot of New Yorkers resent the Brooklyn Nets fans and the organization to a certain degree because it just sort of stems with the other problems that we're experiencing in New York as a city. Like when you're seeing gentrification, when you're seeing like the city changing, like that's sort of, I think, what the Nets symbolize to them. 
because the Nets came from Jersey and a lot of places are coming from other locations and building offices here. And a lot of them are going to Brooklyn and Brooklyn is, well, one time we remember when gentrification was starting, people couldn't afford to live in Manhattan. They were moving to Brooklyn and a lot of places in Brooklyn are now priced out or pricing out other people, whatever. And people got to move from Brooklyn to outside of New York city, et cetera, et cetera. And it sort of represents inflation in that way. A lot of New Yorkers who are born and raised here because the Nets don't have that sort of institution yet. That's going to be, you know, a long time from now if they get there because they're rooted in New Jersey and previously they were in Long Island. So they don't have like the New Yorkers in the same way that the Knicks do, obviously, because the Knicks are born and raised here and have been here for, you know, however many years. And these New Yorkers who have grown up here, like they were Knicks fans. I think it was Bomani Jones Dexter. We were just talking about this where he said that. That sort of, or I think it was Julio that said it in our podcast. But we had him on a couple months ago where he was like, yo, like the Knicks fan base is filled with, you know, a lot of people from all these different cultures. Like you go to a Knicks game, there's Puerto Ricans, there's Dominicans, there's black people from all different locations and things of that nature. There's Jewish people, Greek, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what New York City is supposed to be. And the Nets haven't necessarily gotten there yet. And I think people associate that with, to some degree, gentrification. There is an inside joke amongst some people uh, on social media that call the Nets the Williamsburg Nets because of this kind of thing. They're at Barclays Center. And Dexter, you covered this. Like, you remember at Barclays Center when it was being built here, the things that were being said you know what I mean? And them just sort of moving all these people out and the businesses like you can talk a little bit about that because you were really around that when that was yeah. going on. But I think this is sort of all tied in into how this sort of perception is. And when you think about like the build, the, the, the business example, the Nets come in. They're just the right team at the right time. They have Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and they end up getting James Harden, you know, and it's the same thing as like, like this is this shiny new office whatever. And we have all these different quote unquote assets. I don't call players assets, but some people do, but it's, it's all sort of tied in like business, like big business comes here into the city and they're pushing people out. And this is what sort of happens with, you know, Kevin Durant coming here, Kyrie Irving coming here, James Harden coming here. I think this is the perception of them because Nick fans are accusing them of buying a championship. Whereas they're sort of doing it now or trying to do it now from the ground up, even though they try to do it the same way and just weren't ready at the time. So I think there's a level of symbolism into that because I'm looking at the New York Post also. If you notice, they're talk, they have this their, their playoff column and on the back cover, they have the Knicks and the Nets. And in boxing, I watch boxing, I watch MMA. The A-side team or person, the A-side competitor is always on the right side, your left. That's where the Knicks were on the newspaper. The Nets were on the other side. The Empire State Building, the day before the Knicks were playing their first playoff game, and I think the same day the Nets were playing their first playoff game, they weren't black and white. The colors were blue and orange. You could say that's because they were in Manhattan, but also like they just have that institution built in New York City. I think all these things are sort of connected when you look at it. No, I, th- I think there is. I, the one thing I'll say is you know, the Knicks fans who've been coming at the Nets for buying a championship – I, I don't rock with that because there's many different ways. I'm not to saying I rock with any of this, by the way. Yeah, I'm yeah, just, yeah. I, this I, is I just what I've gathered. You know, if the from Knicks, sort of if, like, you got to give the, you got to give credit to the Nets for what they've done the last couple of years in in building up players and their value and being able to flip them and get these two stars to free agency and being able to trade for James Harden. That, look, if the but, Knicks, but here's do the that, thing. But here's the thing. That's let me, fine. Let me, but let me ask you this though: if they were to do this in Orlando, I don't think the impact would be any less. It just happened that the Nets would be were the right team at the right time. You but, see I'll, what I'm but, saying? but but I will say this: I also don't think they would be able to do that in Orlando. Just like I don't think the Nets would have been able to do it if they were in New Jersey, right? Yeah, like yeah. the the location of them being in Brooklyn, uh, and I could be a biased Brooklyn. Oh no no no! Matters. You're right about the location. I'm just saying about like the team itself is not why they got there. Right, like they didn't go no, like to, they no, didn't right, go right. to become Brooklyn Nets. Where but, in a, but I, like but they I had actually, a different sort of thing. Like they were the right team at the right time. They didn't go to be Brooklyn. The Nets I think are still they were the right in team. that way. 
I think they were the right team at the right time in the right location. I think all that stuff matters, right? Like for them to do it. I think more than now, like I do think sometimes market can be overrated if you haven't won. I do think people are looking for culture, where they can fit, where they can build their brand, where there are marketing opportunities. I think all that stuff matters for players now. And if it so happens to be in a big market, that's going to elevate it higher. That doesn't mean market doesn't matter at all. It's not like people are running to go play in Milwaukee. It's not like people are running to go play in Sacramento. We know that's not true. So being in the number one media market, having competency, which is what the Nets had shown over the last couple of years, matters. Now the Knicks are starting to show, although in a smaller sample size, they're starting to show some competency, and the future could be bright for them as well. So I think all that stuff matters. So it's, it's interesting. I don't think the fan base is have to pin one against the other. I see some stuff from the net side where it's a little bit of little brother, big brother. I think in New York, we see this here with the Yankees, Mets, the Jets, Giants, and LA, they probably see with the Clippers or the Dodgers and the Angels. You see that kind of stuff too. The team that's net doesn't necessarily get talked about as much. The team that's a little brother, those fan bases tend to feel a little inferior. And I can say this as somebody who grew up a Mets fan, the inferior baseball team in town, a Jets fan, when I used to do that, the inferior football team in town, you, you can see within the fan bases, they have a complex. They're always trying to prove themselves. You know, like, oh, we, we, when well, we're coming up, we're trying try to smash other team. And it's like, you don't have to do that. Just focus on you. I wish, I wish both fan bases would just focus on themselves. Like, I don't necessarily sit and worry about, you know, what one other team is doing. Just focus on your team. Put your energy into your team. You know, some of the back and forth and stuff we see is going on Twitter. I mean, I guess it's fun if you're in a series, if you're actually playing against each other. But you know, trying to understand who's the king of New York or all this other stuff. It's just kind of like, whatever. You know what'll change the perceptions and stuff for the Nets? Winning. That's what'll change for them. If they win, it'll change. Or maybe not. Maybe or it maybe not. Like right? that's the or thing maybe, I was gonna say. <laughs> maybe it doesn't matter as much because they haven't done it uh here. I think you can't have it both ways. And this is the uh, maybe you'll make this point for you, B. A lot of people always said, well, if X player X comes and wins a championship for the Knicks and ends the drought. It means something. I think the reason you see such a high level of energy from Knicks fans, we talked about it earlier in game one and other stuff, is it means something that they've done this in this way, that Tibbs has led them back to it, that they're competent. They're not the butt of anybody's jokes. And we saw how people in the media tried to, you know, dismiss their efforts this year. Oh, the defense isn't real. Until now you see all the experts saying the defense is real. Um, I, I, I think that it does, you know, matter for the reasons Brian said, and we had talked about this with Julio, and I did also hear Bomani Jones other make this point. Yes, the the, the the diversity towards the Knicks, basketball is, I know a lot of people say it's a baseball town, but basketball is really the passion sport of mainly immigrants in New York City. And that's why there's such a diverse fan base among the Knicks. There's so many immigrants that picked up and played the sport that love basketball. If you come from other countries, like Brian and I, our parents have, that love basketball here and ended up loving the Knicks uh, so much. And I think that's why they're more into, I don't want to call them true New Yorkers. I don't really want to say that. But the long, tried and true New Yorkers that have a history here, their history is also going to be with the Knicks. Again, that doesn't mean it can't change for the Nets. I think it will. But like Brian made the point, it's going to take generations for that to happen. I watched back in 2006 when he started doing the groundbreaking on Barclays. I was there the first night that the Barclays Center opened. I was there for one of the first Jay-Z concerts. I've seen everything that's happened around the Barclays Center, how gentrification has changed in neighborhoods in Fort Greene and Park Slope and you know Prospect Heights around there, how certain businesses have been pushed out, how they promised more affordable housing and never did it, how they promised more jobs and they never did it, which happens to a lot of people. That affects a lot of people in that. So I understand the view Brian's saying and the things that come up about why this is looked at the as the gentrification tre- team and sort of emblematic of what has happened in Brooklyn. You know, it, it, I, I can see that, and I can see why the deep-rooted New Yorkers that are Knicks fans look at that, and they're like, get that out of here. This is, this is just more nonsense of what we see going on around it. Now, that, yeah. that's no shade to the Nets and their fans, but it's going right. to take generations but I think their fan base rooted in Brooklyn. A lot of kids growing up in Brooklyn, like myself, who love basketball, we were Knicks fans. We grew up Knicks fans. You know what I mean? It's going to take three, four generations of people probably seeing like my daughter's kids, if they live, grow up in Brooklyn, 
to actually see where there's more Nets fans. I think it's growing. The Nets brand is way stronger than it was 20 years ago. Absolutely, just by them coming to Brooklyn. But there's still a ways to go. But I think all this stuff mattering doesn't matter. But I'll tell you what. You know what I want to see? Especially the way things have gone for both teams this year. I'd love to see a Subway Series. Yeah. I'd love to see them play in the, in, the, in the playoffs. I can't wait for that. That'll be so much fun. I think the other thing about this, too, is that, well, a couple things. One, what doesn't really work in their favor long term is that a lot of people just watching basketball now, like, I feel like a lot of kids coming up are not necessarily fans of teams in the same way that your generation and later on my generation was like my generation yeah, growing up, true. we were still fans of like, I'm still a Mets fan. Like I was a jet fan at some point, you know what I mean? I think that growing up kids are identifying more with different players. And you're seeing that with Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, James Harden, where there's a survey that came out that said, who's the most hated team or wherever, whatever. Coincidentally, in New York, the most hated team was actually the Philadelphia 76ers, which I think is actually Knicks fans and Nets fans put together being like, fuck the Sixers. But (laughs) the Nets were the most hated team in a lot of places. And I think that has very little to do with the Nets as an institution and more to do with they have Kevin Durant, they have Kyrie Irving, they have James Harden. They're the super team of right now. Very few teams could be that institution and be hated in that same way. Like, if if the Knicks were to get better than this, then yes, you're going to start seeing them pop up on more of those lists. The Lakers, because they have LeBron James, because they have Anthony Davis, and the Lakers are championship contenders, they're going to be up there. If the Celtics were able to get their shit together and be very good again, they're going to be up there. Like, those are sort of the institutional brands. If Miami, because they're like a glamour city, if they were to become really good, if they were to carry over what they did last year into this year, maybe you start to see them resonate in that way. The Nets still have to build that, obviously, because they're still in their very, very early Brooklyn days. Like, it hasn't even been 10 years since they started playing uh, Brooklyn Nets basketball. So right. there's obviously a pathway to all of this happening. But I think the level of resentment that some Knicks fans have for them And hatred towards them is also projected on like what's going on in the city in general. So I kind of feel for them in that way. And, you know, we'll see what's going like one of the things that I'm really curious about is whether or not the Nets actually win this championship. But beyond that, what happens if they do? Right. Like what happens if they actually get this done this year? Will there just be a collective eye roll? Will like what will be sort of the reaction? Because I feel like we're at a point where when super teams win, we kind of just are like, eh, whatever. You know, like Kevin Durant didn't quite get the respect that he thought he would after winning those two with Golden State. And I think that he might be in for a similar sort of thing here, unfortunately for him, if he were to win uh, this time around, fair or not. So I'm curious to see, like, what's going to be the sort of fallout here now? Because I remember listening to, I think it was uh, David Jacoby recently on Bill Simmons' podcast, and he was saying Julius Randle's the biggest star in New York right now. And look, say what you want, there's a lot of people who seem to feel that way, even with Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden here in this city. Well, it's going to be very interesting to watch going forward, but I I definitely think uh, there's some cultural, and like I said, social relevance to people who've grown up in New York around and watching both teams and we'll see how both are received. But no matter what, for both teams, you know, to get that respect or feelings or reactions around the league, it all comes down to winning. Gotta win. One time for your mind, one time. One time for your mind, one time. One time for your mind. Interesting stuff going on. I found something that troubled me, bothered me immensely, and it's probably going to end up having a lot to do with people hating on you in ways you probably wouldn't think of. And Brian has an announcement that we've been waiting on for a while. He's announced it already, but we are close to some real good news here. What you got, B? One time for your mind. Fiction novel debut coming June 1st. Hidalgo Heights, The Victims of Taking Up Space. Uh, It's a project that I've been working on for a long, long time. Uh, I'm actually going to get deeper into the story later on at some point in terms of like how this sort of came about. But what I will say is that (laughs) I remember in April of last year already, which is crazy because, you know, time is just, I don't know what's going on with time these days. April of last year is when I sort of came up with the idea. I was playing NBA street volume three 
and uh, <laughs> and because NBA Street Volume Three was just a game that like I hadn't seen in a while. I wanted to see if it held up. I wanted to play some street ball, and we had nothing but time because we were at our sort of COVID apex in New York City. Like it was really bad. We were losing like a thousand people a day, literally, et cetera, et cetera. I probably left the crib twice all spring. Like it was really bad. And then I started building this sort of neighborhood because you can do that in NBA Street Volume 3. You could make your own court. You could create your own neighborhood. And then minutes later, I was just writing an outline for the story. So it gets into a lot, and I won't get into the entire thing here. What I will say is that it's very raw. There is um, a lot going on that you'll probably get more of the second time you read it. You'll get it the first time. You'll abs- like If you're paying attention, you'll get it the first time. But there are definitely, inevitably... Uh, be things that you missed um, because that's just how sort of art is when it's very, uh, very intricate and there's just a lot going on. Like me and Dexter have talked about TV shows and things of that nature. And I'm in the middle of watching one right now where I know for a fact that I'm going to need to watch it again because there are just going to be a lot of layers that you sort of miss out. Nobody watches certain like shows that are like well thought out, well put together the very first time and be like, all right, I got every single thing that goes on. Like you don't want that as a creative. So uh, I'm hoping that people do get it and read it front to back twice. It's going to be on Amazon. Uh, it's going to be $20, 1999 actually, uh, physicals, ebooks later on. I'm going to hold those for a little bit because, you know, I want people to get the physicals because the physicals is a little more detail there. And me personally, I like having the book in my hand. I don't, you know, I'm not somebody who gets like on Kindle and eBooks and things like that. And, you know, reads through it because I just don't want to be staring at a screen for longer than I have to, especially these days where everything I'm doing is on a fucking screen. A um, <clears throat> lot of, a lot of characters of color. Uh, it's Latino heavy, but there's also, I mean, as I've said to Dexter before, you can't tell the story of Latinos in New York City without their black friends. Uh, so there are definitely some uh, characters of color all over the place in the story. Uh, there's high school kids, there's adults, there's young adults, and um, there's a lot of cursing. So be aware of that. What, what one, a of my shock. Old, one of my old high school teachers uh, was like, yo, I want to put this in my classroom. And I was like, just be careful because there's a lot of swearing. And the reason for that is, is because like, and my mom is not going to appreciate this because, you know, she's like, oh, why do you have to curse to get your point across? But the thing is, it's very raw. And I remember being in high school and I, you know, remember just earlier times in my life and things like that. Like you just, that's how things come off, especially when you're stressed all the time, you're dealing with certain things, anxiety, whatever. So there are parts of it that was he- that was heavy. And I'm hoping that there's enough humor uh, to at least keep keep people smiling through it, but 268 pages, 24 chapters, prologue, epilogue, and uh, yeah, we're ready to roll. I'm ready to get this shit to, you know, wherever it gotta go. And hopefully, if enough people buy it, then you know, I could uh, I could just do that for a living. <laughs> well, that well, that's the thing, and I wanted to say that. And congrats to you because you know the release date is 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 here and. You're gonna get this out to the world, you know. June first, June first, June first, and I think people need to understand uh, what a jump it is to create your content and put it out to the world. You know, it, it's it's a big jump, step one. But uh, the other thing I wanted to say, coming off of that, Brian said he hopes enough people read it. Look, we've had a lot of people support us on this podcast. We have a lot of people support other things we do. A lot of people always say they want to support independent creators. They want to support minority content creators. Support this. All right. Support. You know, there's a lot of talk. Don't wait for some big publishing house to come on and say they want to give Brian a deal. And I ain't trying to get one, by the way, too. (laughs) This is copywritten and owned by me. I ain't trying to get a publisher. This is independent. This is done. This that stuff matters. And I think it matters more. I'm speaking specifically to our people. When I say our people, I mean our minority audience. You know, obviously now minorities, white folks, you want to come and buy this too, you want to support it, do it. But a lot of times we say we support people, we give our friends likes. We retweet stuff, but yo, are you really going to support it and put the money where your mouth is and not just wait for, you know, if Brian's on a bestseller list or gets whatever accolades, you know, it seems sometimes as a creator, that's when people come and support you when you're now associated with something that's supposedly bigger, but it's like, yo, really invest in your culture, really invest in people that look like you because that's what really matters, you know? So support that the independent journalism, independent content creation, here's your chance. I mean, you've been rocking with us on this. 
here's your chance, Brian, going into something that's a little bit different, but creating content that he's passionate about, telling stories about his people, support that. I think yeah. that's not said enough. We, you know, it's not just a like and a retweet. You know, yep. sometimes when it comes down to, yo, are you actually going to put some money behind and 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 support this man? And this is I'm saying this is somebody who hasn't read a word of this book, not because I couldn't have, because I could have, but you know. I, this is this is something I know as a content creator um, that is absolutely important. So it's important for us to to note that and support Brian as he goes forward with uh, the release of Hidalgo Heights. Yeah, and so and one more thing I forgot to mention is that uh, just so people know, like when you're buying this stuff, like a good percentage of this is going straight to me. Okay, like that's how it sort of works when you're self-publishing through Amazon. And shout out to Mel Projects because they help me on the editorial side and just editing and formatting, laying out. Because you know, for me, it's like I am uh, of a, a different gef- generation of Puerto Rican where I'm willing to pay people to sort of help me out. You know what I mean? Like there are other that we got we got people in our from where we from, and you know how it is. And you're like y'all don't want to pay for we don't want to pay for anything. You know, we just want <laughs> we just want to take care of everything ourselves. But uh, I feel like, you know, I'm not qualified to do everything and you don't want to overexert yourself for everything. So when you do buy this, just know that most of your money is going directly to me. There you go. There you go. Supporting an independent creator, minority creator, content creator, support it. This this, this is the support that a lot of us need when we put in the time and work into what we do. All right. My one time for your mind. Uh, (laughs) Woo! I came across this article this week, and I was bothered. Brian, are you familiar with the app Citizen? Are you familiar with the Citizen, Citizen app? app? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, it. okay. So you I gotta familiar. see what's going on in the neighborhood. You oh, know? so you use it? So you use it and you see what's going on in the oh, neighborhood? I, right? I get notifications for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I think I think the Citizen app. I would like to say this. I think that it's a cool app for people to know what's going on in their neighborhood. I think it's it's dope. Um, sometimes you see some stuff on there that's like kind of funny, like, oh, really? That's what's going on? But oh, okay. Um, as somebody, as a journalist, it's also been extremely helpful to me. When I was covering news uh, for News 12, Citizen App was kind of just popping off at that time. And it was really helpful for a lot of us uh, on the news team and knowing things were going on, getting footage from citizens within the neighborhood that, you know, you might be able to talk somebody or they could show you something, what really went down. So it was definitely important. But, you know, as things go with technology, I feel like sometimes we just can't have good things, man. Sometimes we have good things, and then people got to take it too far. They got to go too far. And a lot of times, it's not even the people. It's not the users. It's the people who create these apps, who create this technology. So I saw this article. I want to give a shout out to the person who wrote it. It's Joseph Cox from Vice. Uh And basically, this article talks about how Citizen App would deploy private security forces at the request of app users. This is according to documents and sources. There were some leaked emails that apparently Vice obtained where they found this out uh, that would happen. The plan marks a dramatic expansion of Citizen's purview. As Brian noticed, currently an app where users report incidents in their neighborhoods. Uh, Based on those reports and stuff, they get these these real-time alerts, right? But now what they're trying to do is to create a privatized secondary emergency response network that if you need private security, uh, you can happen. It can even do stuff as simple as, you know what, I don't feel safe in this neighborhood. I need somebody to walk me to have some private security to come and do this. But if you're watching or you're listening to this podcast, you probably know where I'm going in to this with what the problem is. You probably know what the problem is here. And the problem is, if you're a minority, you're in the wrong neighborhood. You know how <laughs> this is going to end badly for you. You know this isn't going to be right. You know this is going to happen. How many, not how many times it happened to me, but you know, men of color, black men, black women, uh, people of color have been in neighborhoods that aren't necessarily uh, around people who look like them. And the cops can be called on you just for being in that neighborhood. What do you think is going to happen? And now people have the citizen app and it's like, oh, I don't know. Black man on my block who appears to be shady. Why is he shady? Oh, no the reason then he's black. And now you're going to call this privatized security to come and handle a situation that I'm not necessarily sure how well they're equipped for. Race is just the most glaring thing to happen to me. But what about people who are just mad? 
All right. You know, somebody gets into a fight with their ex-girlfriend or something, ex-boyfriend or something. They're mad. This person ain't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Oh, well, I'm going to get him in trouble. I know, or her in trouble. I'm not going to call the police. Let me call citizen private security. And now they're showing up at this person's doorstep who wasn't doing nothing but minding their business. I have a feeling this is going to get a lot of people who weren't doing anything uh, in trouble. It's a bad idea. There's no need for this. This only reinforces the need of why we need professional people to handle different situations. There's a lot of talk around the police and defunding the police and not having police re- respond to mental health situations or those kind of emergencies, actually having trained professionals. When you're now adding privatized security into the mix of all this stuff, no. This is a bad idea. There's going to be a lot of concerns around race and other things. And there were some stuff here I was seeing at the end of this uh, this article. Uh, experts have talked about this and said that the app may actually lead people to report things that aren't crime and may foster racism, right? We've seen this already happen with the police, right? We've seen black people in a Starbucks have the police called on them. And you know what my problem has been all along with that is like, yo, when people erroneously call uh, the cops on people for things that aren't crime related or aren't crimes at all, those people should have to pay. They should have to pay an uh, exorbitant fine or something should be done. You shouldn't just be able to call the cops so willy nilly and nothing happens. Now, when you add this privatized security into this with citizen and who knows what the training behind that is and whatever go- whatever goes, we can't even trust the police on that. So can you imagine this? It's just not a good idea. It's not a good idea at all. Now, Vice tried to get comment from citizens and some of the security uh, companies that they are supposedly working with, and they didn't get any comment back on this. But look, man, it's just uh, it's scary. This this is one that's scary for me. I think with everything we've seen that's gone around with race, racial profiling, policing, people just calling the cops for no reason. I, I mean, I have nothing else to say than. There's no way. There's no way this is a good idea. This is a bad idea. It's a horrible idea. Yeah. Nobody yet. A- well, let me pause. I shouldn't say nobody asked for this. I tend to like to say nobody asked for this. We know who asked for this, right? <laughs> it's the people in certain communities. I'm going to bring it back to something Brian said that are probably gentrifying certain communities that are now worried about the people who are in those communities already that don't look like them that have been living there. And now they feel unsafe. If they're the ones who want this, they're the ones who are going to use this. And you know who's going to get hurt about hurt by it? The black and brown folks that are living in those communities. Not good. Yeah, I don't have much to add here. But what I will say is uh, I'm not sure if this is going to go over well because of all the points you laid out. But also just like this feels like a setup, obviously. Yeah. You know, like and I'm, I'm just very – look. On, on a on a day where we're talking about of all fucking things, there's uh reports going on at George Floyd Square commemorating, you know, one year since he passed. And there's like a drive by shooting which people are tying into potential gang violence in the area. I'm not sure. Um <clears throat> I will say that based off those gunshots, them dudes sound like they knew each other. And you probably know what I'm talking about if you mm-hmm. have heard certain things before. Like, there's a certain rhythm to, you know, certain gunfights uh, when people are familiar with one another. But what I will say is that, like, when you have stuff like this going on and it's like, I mean, just what are we, what are, what are, what are we really doing? I'm not going to ask what's the point of all this because I feel like I know what the point is and I feel like, Dexter, you already said as much. But it's just like, what, where, where, where are things really going? It makes me question that. But, you know, hopefully uh, hopefully this doesn't blow up in a way that I think it possibly could. And uh, I'm uh, going to keep the Citizen app around just, you know, just to, just to keep my, my, my pulse on the city, <laughs> so to speak, because a lot of shit be going on. Especially, you know, when I'm in other parts of New York City. But, you know, yeah, this is just another one of those things like Dex, you've on one time for your mind, you've talked about facial recognition and I had a very similar response. So, you know, I feel like this is kind of in that same vein. Yeah, we got to start looking at this, uh, especially around how these things are going to affect uh, people of color, because we know policing this country disproportionately affects people of color negatively and they're not given the benefit of the doubt uh, the way it is when it's the other way around. 
All right, but that's it for this episode of the Ain't Hard to Sell podcast, episode 179. We hope you enjoyed it and all the talk around the NBA playoffs. Let us know what you think about that, what you're looking forward to. Maybe if you think it matters more, if the Knicks or Nets are more relevant in New York, let um, be sure to check out Brian's book coming out on June 1st. Support that. And also let us know what you think about uh, the Citizen app. Probably, probably, possibly, you know, who knows what this will go through, having privatized security. A lot we went through on this episode. A lot more uh, coming out. You can see Brian and I later this week on NBA Picks and Props. You can catch me Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the NBA Exchange talking more basketball. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry and our producer, Greg Alcala. Till next time, y'all. Peace.